Hello. I'm blessed to be able to talk with you about this concept of faith. Faith is the evidence. And I'd like for us to begin by reading Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I'm just calling this faith is the evidence. And the idea here is to uh, take a look at faith and its connection to evidence over the next uh, few minutes as we think about what this means. There are common ideas in the world about what faith is. People believe, for example, that faith is believing in spite of or without evidence. Uh, you can look it up in uh, some philosophical dictionaries, for example, and they'll tell you something to that effect. Or that faith and reason are at odds with each other. Some people will say, well, you have faith, but we have reason. And uh, they think somehow that faith and reason are uh, not compatible. Uh, or that faith is superstition, while science is knowledge. And so we have science, and we have reason, and we have evidence. You just have faith. You have superstition. And, uh, you know, they just are not compatible with one another. And so there are a lot of ideas about what faith is in the world. And I think one of the reasons why this is so important to us is because if, if we are not talking about the same thing, if you say to somebody, I have faith, and their concept of faith is, well, then you must believe in spite of evidence, or uh, you don't have reason, or something like that, because they have a, a bad definition of faith, then you're not going to be able to talk with one another very well. And so sometimes we miss uh, each other uh, in our discussions because we don't mean the same thing, even though we're using the same words. And so one of our goals in, in these lessons is to try to understand what these words are, particularly in our context as Christians, and then how we can better talk with people uh, about these matters. Uh, so faith is not believing in spite of evidence, or faith and reason are not at odds with each other, and faith is not a superstition. And what we want to show here is that really everybody has faith in something. And so our task is, uh, first of all, to debunk the false concepts of faith and then to establish a biblical working definition of faith. When scripture talks about faith, what does it mean? When we tell people we have faith, what do we mean by that? And I think it's important that we have a good understanding of that so that we can have better conversations with one another. But also to encourage true faith in such a way that our lives reflect that trust. We want to trust God. We want to, to show others that we trust God and we want to be lights in the world. And uh, we have to encourage that true faith to reflect that in our lives, that faith is not just some intellectual thing that we say we have. I believe something in my head, but it has a practical outcome in the way that we live our lives. And it's important then that we keep that before us. We read Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 to begin with, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now I want you to see verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And so we understand the importance of faith biblically here is we can't please God unless we have it. Uh, but again, what does that mean exactly? Does that simply mean that we believe he exists? Well, no, it says you've got to believe that, but you've also got to believe he rewards those who seek him. And so the idea of seeking God becomes an important factor here in understanding what it means to have faith. I want to look at uh, John chapter 20 uh, for just a moment. Now, in context, Jesus has risen from the dead. And then he appears to his disciples. And you recall the first time that he uh, appeared, Thomas was not present. And so when the other disciples tell Thomas, we have seen the risen Lord, he says, well, I'm not going to believe unless I see. I've got to see. I've got to touch. So he has this kind of mentality that uh, isn't unlike what some would today have. And that is, I can't believe something that I can't put my hands on or, or something to that effect. 
And so the second time Jesus appears to them then, Thomas is present, and Jesus says, well, go ahead, Thomas, go ahead and touch. Here it is, look and, and see and feel, and uh, don't be unbelieving, right? And so Jesus says then, you know, and, and Thomas at that point says in verse 28, my Lord and my God. I mean, what other kind of response can you give? Uh, he recognizes that Jesus uh, really was risen from the dead, and the implications of that being that uh, he truly is Lord and God. So then Jesus says to him in verse 29, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. So Jesus says, you believe because you've seen me, but there's a special blessing, if you will, for those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no evidence. Not seeing something directly doesn't mean there's no evidence. Because what's said next really kind of gives us a sense of what John was doing. Jesus had performed a number of signs, and John is telling us that the reason he did this and the reason they're written down is so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. So there's the practical outcome of our faith. So John says, I want you to believe, but that belief is based upon the testimony of those who saw, and it has been written down. And so John isn't saying believe in spite of evidence, but believe because of the evidence that has been given. And to recognize that just because you haven't seen something firsthand doesn't mean it hasn't happened. I want to look over at 1 Peter chapter 3 now. And, and again, we're, we're trying to look at a few passages here to give us a, a decent overall picture of what biblical faith uh, really is and entails. 1 Peter chapter 3, um, Peter has been discussing the problem of uh, you know, Christians facing persecutions, the kind of lives they need to be living in response to that, uh, keeping their conduct honorable so that people would come to glorify God in the day of visitation, and making sure that they're not acting in ways that are contrary to what Christ calls us to live. Then in this section in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. People may try to harm us as children of God, but Peter is, is trying to put this in perspective. Really, who's going to harm you? If, if you're faithful to God, uh, who's going to really harm you? Uh, the book of Revelation, I think, is important for understanding that as well, that perspective, that even though the world may seek to do you harm, even though Babylon may seek to do you harm, God vindicates his people, God protects his people, that doesn't mean that there's no physical harm, there's no physical persecution. But ultimately, we're trusting God that we will be vindicated in our faith. And so if we should suffer for righteousness sake, he says, you're, you're really going to be blessed. So don't be afraid of that. But in your hearts, honor Christ as holy. In other words, set Christ apart in your hearts as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you a reason. Now, the, the word defense there is the word from which we get apology. Uh, so he's saying, be prepared to make an apology. Now, here's the thing. Uh, we often think of an apology as, as saying, I'm sorry for something. Well, today, that's what that means. Back then, that's not what that meant. Back then, it was basically giving a verbal defense. Paul said in Philippians 1, 16 and 17, I'm set for the defense of the gospel. And so the idea of giving an apology here is that of giving a defense for what you believe. 
And so you give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason of the hope that is in you. We have a hope. We live in view of that hope. And I think in context here, if someone is going to be persecuted for the sake of Christ, yet they're going to persevere and do what's right, people are going to want to know why. Why would you live that way? Why would you act that way? Why would you do that if you're going to be persecuted? And the answer is because I've set Christ apart in my heart and there are reasons here why I have a hope in him, that I've been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so as Christians, we we have Christ set apart as holy in our hearts and we are prepared to make a defense for the reason of the hope that is in us. And so again, that requires this, this kind of faith. So as we think about those passages then, how would we define faith here? Uh, first of all, again, going back to Hebrews 11 and verse 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Here's what that says, I believe, and that is that faith stands under hope, And it demonstrates our conviction and trust in the reality of what we cannot see. Uh, Sometimes we look at this passage and we say, well, this means faith has evidence. Well, I do believe we, we believe based on evidence. But what this passage is saying is that what, what is it that stands under our hope? What is it that, that uh, sits under the hope that we have? And his answer is your faith. And your faith itself is the evidence. That is, faith is the evidence of what? It's the evidence that you believe in the reality of something that you cannot see. And so if we, if we, if we can't see it necessarily, and, and uh, yet we still have confidence that it's real, that it's true, that it's right. In this case, we're talking about God. God is real. God is true. And the hope that we have is based upon the resurrection of Jesus, even though we haven't seen. Remember, Jesus says, blessed are those who haven't seen and yet have believed. So our faith is the evidence of that conviction. And by living it, not just saying it, but by living it, we are demonstrating to people that we trust in the reality of what we cannot see. Now, there is a reasonable nature to our faith. You know, again, sometimes people will pit faith and reason against each other. But but what we learn in Scripture as we understand what faith really is, is that there's something reasonable about that. And uh, you don't have to have a faith that is unreasonable. And so I would just suggest to you that there, there are three things here that faith requires in order for there to be a reasonable kind of faith. It is possible that your faith is unreasonable. I mean, it's possible that you believe something in spite of evidence, but but that's not biblical faith. Biblical faith, first of all, needs some kind of understanding. Now, I'm referencing here uh, Acts, the 17th chapter, and this is where Paul went into the city of Athens and uh, he goes to the Areopagus and he's able to view kind of a, a, a rounded view of the city. And you could see the evidence of the idolatry just lining the streets of the city going down to the temple of Vulcan and then the, the uh, Parthenon up on the, up on the hill above. And um, Paul uses this then as an opportunity to talk to them. And uh, he says in verse 23 that while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. So notice there, you're worshiping something in ignorance, and that's not good enough. You you, you can't be ignorant about God. There has to be some level of understanding. And then he begins to tell something about this God they don't know. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God. 
So he's saying here, I want you to have some understanding of who this God is. I believe in our current culture that this is the place we often need to start with people. You know, the people have all kinds of ideas about God, and we'll talk about that in another lesson. But again, like the word faith, the word God, people often have different views of, and so sometimes we talk to them and, and we just miss each other because we don't mean the same thing by the same word. And so we, we sometimes have to start with this idea, let's talk about the God you don't know, the, the actual biblical God. People have views that they bring to the table about God, but what does the scripture really teach about God? So there needs to be some level of understanding if we're going to have a reasonable faith. Secondly, there needs to be a readiness to act. Remember in Hebrews eleven six, 6, we must believe that he is and also that he rewards those who seek him has to be some readiness to act. James talks about that in James chapters 1 and 2, a very practical book that aims at showing why it's important to act like we ought to. And, uh, you know, faith without works is dead, and here's what you need to be doing. And the point simply is this. If we're going to proclaim that we have faith in God, are we actually demonstrating it? Remember the definition of faith. It is the demonstration of of our conviction and what we really can't see. So if we really can't see God and yet we trust that he exists, then we're gonna trust also that we're rewarded if we seek him. We need to be willing to act upon that and not simply say that we believe, but actually do the things that God teaches us to do in his word. And so it really demonstrates the trust that we ought to have. And, and by the way, that's that's really the, the word we're talking about. It's not just belief mentally, but it's a trust. And thirdly, there needs to be a reason for that acceptance. Now, we've already referenced 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. We set Christ apart in our hearts as Lord, and we're ready to give a defense for the reason of the hope that is in us. If someone's going to ask me, why do you believe, why do you live as you do, am I ready to talk about that? Am I ready to say, this is why I have hope. This is why I believe in God. And, and you know, here, here are the reasons. And so to be able to do that, to have some reason for that. I love the account in John 6 when Jesus has fed the 5,000 there in John's account. And then he uh, teaches about himself that he is the bread of life who's come down out of heaven and then he tells them, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, they misunderstood what he meant by that. And so many went away. Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, are you going to go away also? And I love Peter's response here in verse 68. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have come to believe and know you are the Holy One of God. And so that, that response is a demonstration on Peter's part. We know who you are. We have a reason to believe who you are. Now, that doesn't mean they understood everything about what Jesus was doing, because John, the Gospel of John is, is, shows chapter after chapter people's misunderstandings, and sometimes that's the disciples. But uh, Peter says, we know who you are, and we have a reason to accept that, and we're going to stay with you. And so that's the nature of the reasonable nature of faith that we're talking about here. And so faith involves various aspects of who we are. Biblical faith, that is. Faith involves the intellect, the use of the mind. As Christians, we believe God created humanity in his image, that he gave human beings the ability to think and to reason, and to make moral decisions with free will. We believe that God gave us minds to think, to reason things out. And, and that means we've got to learn how to use them well, to, to develop the mind of Christ, as Philippians 2 talks about, and to, to be able to think on the things of God, to think about the things that are good and noble and right and true and pure in Philippians 4 and verse 8. God gave us minds. We need to train them. We need to use them. Hebrews 5 talks about being able to, to discern good and evil. That requires thinking. 
So God gave us minds to think. He does not ask us to turn our brains off when we become Christians. Just the opposite. We've got to be thinking Christians, people who are using our minds well and uh, learning how to think well. And so faith involves the intellect. Faith is not anti-intellectual. Faith involves the use of the mind, involves the intellect. Secondly, uh, faith involves the emotions. That there is a sensitive reaction to this. We're not saying in this at all That by having faith, as we're defining it and talking about it here biblically, we're not saying that that means we're devoid of emotion. Uh, That that faith becomes just some kind of a of a of a thing you do in your mind, and and uh, you know you go through these road actions and that. No, there's an emotional sensitive reaction to 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 what we do, and the the danger is in allowing emotions to lead. Emotions need to follow the truth, uh, but just because we follow truth doesn't mean there's no emotion there. Now, what's interesting to me is uh, this passage in in James chapter 2, as he's talking there about the nature of faith, and he says, you know, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Notice there he says that the demons have an intellectual faith And the demons have an emotional reaction to that. So there's an intellectual, there's an emotional side to that. Yet, who among us would say, well, the demons are okay because they have faith? No, there's something missing still, isn't there? And so faith involves the intellect, faith involves the emotion, but that's not all there is. There's one more thing to think about, and that is that faith involves the will putting it into practice, doing what you know is right and following the will of God. And that's what faith is going to involve. Faith is is involving the intellect, the emotion, and the will, and that's what James 2 is talking about. We've got to have the mind uh, focused properly, we've got to have the right response emotionally, and we've got to put it into practice uh, with the will. Now, there's some things faith does not require. When we say that faith requires certain things to be reasonable, there are also some things we recognize that faith does not always require. And one is that we do not have to understand everything. We already said reasonable faith has some level of understanding. If we're going to talk about God, we have to have some understanding of who it is we're talking about. Not the unknown God, but the God who made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, just as Paul talked about in Acts 17. But that doesn't mean we think we're going to understand everything about God. Uh, God is is transcendent. He's beyond us at the same time he's made himself known. But there's going to be things about him we don't understand. For example, Ephesians 3 and verse 20 makes this statement about about what we think. And, And he says there that God is able to do far more abundantly beyond anything we can ask or think. God is capable of doing what we are not capable of thinking. And so that tells us right there that there are some things that we're just not going to fully understand about God. Uh, God's wisdom and knowledge, according to Romans 11, is unfathomable. His understanding is infinite. And so we'll talk more about God But the point is to realize that when we say we need to understand something about God, we're not saying we understand everything about God. And and I think that's the way it works practically. I often like to ask people, you know, how many of you um, understand everything about a car? Well, usually there are mechanics in the audience and maybe somebody who says, well, I can take apart a car and put it back together. But that's not everybody. That's not the norm. And most of us, Though we don't understand all the inner workings of a vehicle, are still willing to get in and get in it and drive it. Uh, same thing with a computer. There are going to be some people who know the intricate workings of a computer. Most of us just buy a computer and use it. Uh, we understand certain features of it, certain aspects of it, but we don't understand everything. And yet that doesn't keep us from being able to utilize that. Uh, how much greater our gap of knowledge between us and God, and yet. God makes himself known in such a way that we can trust him. 
Secondly, we don't have to know all the whys as to why everything happens the way that it does. And the book of Job, I think, is a good example of that. If somebody were to ask, why is all this suffering in the world? I don't necessarily know all the answers, particularly when it comes to someone's individual personal suffering. I can give you answers, perhaps biblically, about why suffering exists in the first place. Sin entered this world and corrupted everything, but that doesn't answer everybody's personal suffering. And uh, in other words, why this particular person, why that particular disease? I don't know. Uh, and so Job reminds us that, uh, you know, as Job is wondering why he was suffering the way that he was, uh, God finally comes on the scene in chapter 38, and, and his, his answer is not, Job, let me explain all the intricacies of this to you. His answer was basically, you weren't there when I created everything, and you're just going to have to trust me. Uh, a child doesn't understand everything that a parent does, or why a parent does everything, but yet, at some point, the parent basically is going to say, you're just going to have to trust me. And so we, we don't know all the whys and wherefores, but the question is, do we have enough to trust God? And I believe the answer is yes to that. And it doesn't require that we physically see. We've already referenced John chapter 20 and verse 29, but in order to believe in God, I don't have to physically see him to know that the effects are there and he's real and, and all of that. So I don't have to see the wind to know that there's a wind that's blowing leaves and trees and so forth. Uh, we can see the effects of that, and Jesus references that kind of thing in, in John the third chapter. So we don't have to physically see, but Jesus says, blessed are those who haven't seen and yet have believed. Think about it like being in a court of law. Uh, we have documents, we have eyewitnesses, uh, we have uh, comprehensive explanations of things, uh, we make cumulative cases. We, you know, a uh, prosecutor might get up and say, "Look at this. Uh, you know, exhibit A, exhibit B, exhibit C. Here's some eyewitnesses." Uh, and how? And the question then becomes, how do you best explain everything? And you're making a case where, in a court of law, we we think about it as an inference to the best explanation to explain everything altogether. And the point is simply this: we have evidence that we can put together. And, and the question really becomes, is there reasonable doubt? Well, uh, I, I think there, there can reach a point where doubt becomes unreasonable. And uh, sometimes that's, uh, that's what people have, uh, is unreasonable kind of doubt. But as in historical matters, uh, we weren't there historically to, to see things, but yet we trust the reality of what is there. I, I like to ask the question of people, who was the first president of the United States. Now, most people are going to get it, right? George Washington was first president of the United States. But were you there? Did you see the inauguration? Were you, were you eyewitness to it? No, but you say, well, we have documents, we have eyewitness accounts, we have other evidence that corroborates, and so we can say with certainty that this was the first president of the United States. Even your own personal families. Um, I, I sometimes ask people the question, Do you, are you certain you know who your mother is? And that's in jest in, in some sense, but, but the truth is, I'm saying, well, obviously you were there when you were born, but if I really wanted to be a, the kind of skeptic that some people are, I could say, well, you know, you could have been switched at birth, they could have changed the records, something else may have happened. How do you know? How do you prove it? Have you done a, a scientific DNA testing to prove it? Uh, well, actually, some people have. I have. My mom is uh, big into genealogy, and so uh, she asked me to get a, a test one day to verify some family members some, that she was uh, uh, researching. Uh, so, yeah, she was my mom. But uh, the point is that we trust. We, we don't go through life every day wondering about these things, typically speaking, unless we have reason to do so. Uh, but we trust even historically that that is the case. And I'll just end here with uh, the reference in Luke chapter 1. Uh, I love the point Luke makes. He says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, 
to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Notice what Luke says here. I'm talking about things that have really happened, things that have been accomplished. This is not a fairy tale type of opening here. It's not a once upon a time this happened, and let me just tell you this uh, fairy tale myth here. Uh, but rather, he's saying, I want you to know exactly what took place. And it's corroborated by eyewitnesses. There were eyewitnesses were there. They delivered these things to us. Luke says, I have investigated everything carefully. I have followed all things closely. I've checked it out. And I'm writing this so that you may have certainty about the things you have been taught. That's the way the gospel opens. And so uh, we, we give Luke the benefit of any doubt here that he knew what he was talking about. He was there. Uh, he examined eyewitnesses. Uh, he was able to do the, the research uh, and lived at that, at that same time frame. Uh, so my point is that this is the kind of evidence we're talking about, historical kind of evidence, uh, evidence like it would be in a court of law. And uh, here it's based upon eyewitness testimony, following and investigations, and uh, knowing the certainty of what has been taught. So faith is the evidence. And we simply start with that as kind of groundwork for other things that we will be discussing. So I appreciate your uh, attention uh, during this time. Thank you.